Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Sheikh Abu Sanankwa, and I'm one of the co-presidents of the Africa Business Club here at the Harvard Business School. On behalf of the club, we'd like to welcome you to our third and final keynote address of the day. We're very fortunate today um, to have Mr. Ekpe. He's a man that needs no introduction. He's a pioneer, a trailblazer, and a visionary in the financial sector in Africa. With over 30 years of experience in the field, he has been able to build what is today the company that epitomizes what the regional integration is. He was the mastermind behind the creation of the Ecobank Group, which is present in 32 countries in Africa and is listed on three exchanges. Throughout the day, we've seen the topic of integration for a host of different um, perspectives. This morning, our first keynote looked at it from the perspective of ArcelorMittal, which is a global company that has to be both global and local and competitive on the global stage. Then we've looked at it as well from a more macro perspective with Mr. Richard Atias, which is in terms of what does integration and regional integration mean when you put it in the context of the broader world. And we've talked a bit about what happened in a lot of other regions of the world and what are the challenges to regional integration and integration within the broader world. Now today, with the Ecobank Group and Mr. Ekpe, we'll be able to look at this from the perspective of somebody that has built something from the ground up, an institution that has been um, the epitome of what it would take in terms of solving the challenges of and capitalizing on the opportunities of all the potential that Africa has to offer. Um, Mr. Ekpe holds a first class honors degree in mechanical engineering and a master's in business administration from Manchester United University. <laughs> Chelsea's better. <laughs> a master in business in business administration from Manchester University and Manchester Business School respectively. And he has also held several positions in the field. Most notably, he was the head of Sub-Saharan Africa Structured Trade and Corporate Finance at Citibank in the 90s. And he was also a managing director at UBA. Please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to Mr. Arnold Ekpe. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all very much for staying back this late uh, to listen to my address. Um, I'm particularly delighted to be here because I was here uh, right at the beginning of the commencement of the African Business Club. Um, I think somewhere around 1998 or 1999, I was invited to give a talk, not a keynote address, and I was very impressed and, quite frankly, very delighted with the orientation and the attitude that I think was coming across a generation of Africans that we think hold the future to our continent. Um, I'm very pleased and particularly delighted to be asked to make a keynote address on a topic that I think is very close to my heart. It's a topic on which I have staked a significant part of my professional career, which is the challenge of integration in Africa. And I would like to use as an illustration the case of Ecobank and what we've tried to do to overcome these challenges, the fun we've had, the lessons we've learned, and what we think we would look at going forward. I do this because at this point in time in my life, as some of you know, I'm retiring at the end of this year, and we're going to hand over the, bat the baton to an ex-student of Harvard Business School, Thierry Tano. Now, the Ecobank story is one of trying to overcome the challenges of dealing in Africa. We at Ecobank started a journey way back in 1985 when Ecobank was created as a West African institution 
by West African businessmen. At that point in time in West Africa, all the banks were either foreign owned or state owned. And there's a group of businessmen who came together and said, we'd like to do something a little bit more interesting, something a little bit more orientated to Africa. And Ecobank was the result of that process. Um, it was the first regional fundraising in Africa. And as a result of that, we started um, in Togo, uh, which is a very small country sandwiched between Ghana on the one hand and the Republic of Benin on the other hand. Contrary to popular views, Ecobank is not a Nigerian bank. Okay? Um, now, in terms of what we tried to do, we looked at West Africa at that point in time, and we said to ourselves, there was no bank that covered all of West Africa. So we tried to use West Africa as our initial launch pad. And we started in Togo, and we built into Ghana, in Nigeria, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, and we covered all of West Africa. And we took a look, we stepped back and said to ourselves, what is going on in Africa? And please bear in mind that all of this was happening in the late um, 80s, early 90s, when at that point in time, as you remember, there was the structural adjustment program. The African economies were in recession. They had all overborrowed. Financial institutions and governmental institutions were all in a mess. Now, that reminds me of what's going on in a certain part of the world today. Now, you, the reaction they have to it is kind of different from the reaction that we had. We had to swallow the medicine of that, of structural adjustment. We had to go through all of this. But that is what has strengthened Africa. That's what made Africa what it is today. So Ecobank went through that process, and we said to ourselves, what exactly is the future of Africa? And when we looked at Africa in terms of the banking space, we saw Africa as breaking down into three subsectors. Uh, one was North Africa, which was more closely allied to uh, the Middle East and the Mediterranean. South Africa, which was um, much more developed, with much larger banks. And the rest was a region that we called Middle Africa. Now, Middle Africa is a term we invented essentially to describe that bit of Africa, of Sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa and the Rand Zone. Now, that's what it gets very interesting. Most international and most investor perceptions of Middle Africa is that it's a very risky area. There is a fear factor, a perception factor, that essentially goes with that. But let me tell you what the reality is. The reality is that Middle Africa is one of the fastest growing regions in all of Africa. It's one of the richest regions in the world. It is a region with fantastic demographics. Over 50% of the population is 20 years or younger. It is a region with a highly underbanked population, so there was huge prospect for growth in the future. So if you looked at the perception of Middle Africa and the reality of Middle Africa, they were completely at variance. So we took the view, we took the view that we were not going to be put off by the perception of the risk and we're going to face the reality of what's Middle Africa. Today, Middle Africa, as a region, has a GDP approaching $1 trillion. It has a population in excess of 500 million people. It is a region that is urbanizing at a very fast rate. I think the rate of urbanization is about 40%. China, which is a close example, is about 45%. So we're talking of a region that has significant growth potential. Now, within that region, we decided that we're going to expand very rapidly. And today, as I speak to you, Ecobank is present in 32 African countries, more than any other bank in the world. We employ, across our network, 20,000 people from 40 nationalities in over 1,140 branches. Now, the reason why this is interesting is because we do this all from Togo. <laughs> now you laugh, you see. Um, and I think a lot of people took the view that a bank from Togo couldn't be 
a Pan-African bank. We, we don't take that view. We took the view that the potential in Africa was such that whichever bank, whichever institution was to see the potential, we could take advantage of it. So that's what we did. And we moved rapidly across the continent. And you know what was interesting? Now, some of the regulators, some of the governments may not like a bank because it is a Nigerian bank, or it's a South African bank, it's an American bank, but you can't really have anything against a bank from Togo. <laughs> yeah? So, we in effect turned Togo into a competitive advantage. <laughs> now, that region, it's also a region that Sorry, I think I've got the wrong slide. Um, it's also a region that has another attribute, which is that if you look at how Africa is evolving, the introduction of mobile telephony is accelerating the development of those countries. And we are at the cusp of that. So what we've done across the countries in which we operate is to operate EcoBank as one bank. What does that mean? It means that we have common standards across all the countries in which we operate. The same policies, principles, the same strategy, more or less, same technology, same risk management criteria. And the argument we had at first was that it could not be done. Every African country is different. We didn't agree. We said, no, most African countries are actually quite similar. The difference is probably that extra 5%, and we'll make an allowance for that. So across EcoBank, we operate EcoBank as one bank. If we move you from Lagos to Burundi, you can start working the following day. You don't have to learn new policies and new procedures. The one bank concept also meant that we had to build the largest corporate telecommunications network across Africa. It also meant that today we run the largest technology center in middle Africa. We have a huge technology center and we run all of our, subsidi all of our companies, all of our subsidiaries, all of our branches from one location. Now, the other aspect I needed to talk to you about is in building a Pan-African um, network, we have used the concept of alliances very effectively. The reason is because we could, or at least we felt, we could not do everything. There were certain areas in which we thought we could get some help, and in those areas, we worked with other parties. So for example, with NetBank, uh, we have an alliance. The NetBank EcoBank Alliance is a unique alliance in terms of two financial institutions coming together. The alliance has three layers to it. One is we run the NetBank EcoBank network as one network, as one common experience. So if you're a corporate in South Africa and you wanted to go into the rest of Africa, then of course you had the opportunity to utilize the EcoBank network as if, you were, as if we were an extension of NetBank. In the case of um, Old Mutual, we have an alliance with Old Mutual, but also allows us to access the bank assurance expertise of Old Mutual across Africa. For those of you who don't know, Old Mutual is actually the largest um, insurance company in Africa and one of the largest in the world. Now, we've also built an alliance with Bank of China uh, in terms of China-Africa trade, and that alliance has meant that we have essentially Chinese employees seconded from Bank of China uh, to EcoBank affiliates across Africa. We have two of them in, in Ghana. And uh, since we, we really couldn't pronounce their names in Chinese, we, we decided to call them Kwame and Kofi. <laughs> so uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, we have two, two Chinese Kwames and Kofis, and possibly their offsprings in future who might be with EcoBank. Um, so, so what, what that means in practice as well is that we have now reorganized EcoBank um, into Pan-African businesses. 
Um, previously, we were structured geographically. Now we run the group on a pan-African basis. And the Ecobank Corporate Bank provides a one-stop banking solution for corporates, uh, multinationals, NGOs doing business in Africa. So if you wanted to deal in 32 African countries, instead of talking to one bank in every country, you talk to one account officer and he delivers 32 countries to you. That's a very powerful proposition. Okay. In the domestic bank, we run a portfolio of domestic banking businesses, um, and that is really our retail network. Retail represents a very interesting opportunity in Africa, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And lastly, lastly we have Ecobank Capital. Ecobank Capital is an investment banking arm, um, which essentially groups our treasury, asset management, and our investment banking businesses. So out of our office in Paris, for example, we run the largest a trading desk for African currencies. We do 18 currencies out of, um, out of Paris, and no other bank does that. What this is telling you, at least what I'm hoping I'm sharing with you, is that we've taken those challenges, uh, um, that, at least the perceptions of challenges in Africa, and turned them into opportunities to leverage the network. So the issue of integration in Africa raises challenges as well as opportunities. Now, within the, the Pan-African businesses, I'd just like to talk a little bit about some of the geographical clusters that we run. Uh, we run three to six geographical clusters. The first is Francophone West Africa, the Union Economic and Monetary West Africa, which is um, the, the eight countries who have a common currency, a common central bank, and a common set of business laws. And then we have the rest of West Africa, um, excluding Nigeria, um, which we call the West African Monetary Zone. And then we have CEMAC, um, which is the six countries of Francophone Central Africa. And then we have the East African community, which groups five countries. Um, and then the SADC regions, which includes, in our opinion, Angola and the DRC. So that's how we've organized the group regionally, but those regions sit within three Pan-African businesses. I just want to dwell about the retail sector and the potential for Africa. As we speak, less than 20% of the African population is banked. In some markets, it's as low as 6%. We think that that represents a huge opportunity. And Ecobank has been evolving and working to address that opportunity, both using our resources but working with partners as well. We believe that if you, the whole banking space in Africa currently is worth about $107 billion and it's growing at about 15% per annum. That's one of the highest growth rates of any banking sector across the world. Now, what, have we, what are we trying to do? With Airtel and with MTN, we have alliances to focus on mobile telephony and we've worked with um, Oliver Wyman and, and the Gates Foundation to see how we can use the mobile phone to, to provide savings products as well as credit products um, to the underbanked, the rural poor. And we've also used it as a way of crossing borders, of being able to move money across borders in Africa. Uh, we're also a member of M-Pesa in, in Kenya and we also work with Zane, which used to be called Celtel. Let me talk about some of the products that we've developed to address the African market. The first is what we call rapid transfer, transfer rapide in, in French. And literally, we are currently the leading bank in moving money across Africa. What is not always known is that there are more Africans in diaspora in Africa than there are outside of Africa. And there are not enough financial services, financial products to address their needs. These Africans need to move money to their home countries, families and relations. They need to save, they need to build houses, and the Ecobank Rapid Transfer is a product that's developed to address that. The second product I'd like to share with you is the Ecobank Regional Card. Again, this was another product that was designed to overcome some of the obstacles in Africa. So if you have an Ecobank regional card and you have a local currency account, for example, in Mali, 
and you are going to go to Chad, you could use that card and collect local currency in Chad. You could also do the same in Kenya and also in South Africa. Increasingly, what we found in the development of EcoBank is that what were considered insurmountable barriers or obstacles turned out to be opportunities. But you've got to invest the time, you've got to innovate, you've got to be creative in addressing those opportunities. Now, as a result of that, we have increased the number of account holders in EcoBank by 50% over the last two years. The other aspect of our business, which also represents an emerging trend in Africa, is that banking is not a commodity, it's a commodity business. In commodity businesses, scale is important. And therefore, we have worked very hard to build scale across Africa. We're considered one of the leading banks in middle Africa. In terms of our strategic geography, we are either number one or number two. Now, I'll share with you a couple of examples. Whilst we have adopted a flexible strategy of growing organically and inorganically, we have grown significantly by organic growth. But in certain markets, we have adopted a fast-track approach to achieving market dominance or significant market position. That was the thinking behind the acquisition of Oceanic Bank in Nigeria, as a result of which we moved from a mid-tier bank to one of the systemic banks in the country, and also Trust Bank in Ghana, where we moved from uh, the number three bank to the number one bank in Ghana. Now, across all of Africa, our strategy, our policy is to be top three. And I'm pleased to inform you that we're top three in half of the markets in which we operate, and we're top 10 in 23 of the 30 markets in which we have banking subsidiaries. So the strategy does work in principle. Moving forward, and going back to the issue of regional integration, it is important that we all bear in mind that Africa is the most fragmented continent in the world. We have 56 countries in the continent. Many of them are small. The country in which I am based, which is Togo, consists of 5 million people and has a GDP of 6 billion. Now, Togo on its own is probably not viable or sustainable in the long term, but Togo as part of a larger market, if Togo is part of a larger market that includes, for example, Nigeria or Ghana, becomes a very interesting proposition. So the importance and the significance of integration across Africa is extremely important and is tied significantly to the sustainability and the viability of African economies. One example I'd like to share with you is the East African economy, uh, community, which is a recent, probably the most recent, of the various uh, economic blocks that we have in Africa. It consists of five countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. Each of those countries on its own is a very small market. Together, they add up to 132 million people. And that's about the same size as the Nigerian market. That becomes a more interesting market. And we know, because we're present in all the countries there, that they're working to reduce all the exchange control and other barriers that affect the ability to be able to run an integrated market. So I think that if you look at both the corporate level and if you look at the political level, the challenges of integration are the challenges of the willingness and the commitment of companies and governments to regional integration. I think the compelling logic for regional integration is not in dispute. But I think what we have struggled with and what we continue to struggle with is to understand that without integration, Africa remains fragmented and not terribly attractive to investors as individual countries.
Now, what's the future? The future for EcoBank is that we have a few countries that we need to be present in. We're substantially built out, but we do have a few countries we need to be present in. Uh, one is Angola. Angola is a very important market. Um, Mozambique. Uh, Ethiopia, when Ethiopia opens itself up to foreign banks, because currently Ethiopia doesn't authorize foreign banks. Internationally, uh, we are in London, we are in Paris, we are in Dubai. We'd like to be in China and we'd like to be in the United States of America. Um, all those licenses are pending. As you know, banking is the most regulated industry in the world today. Bankers are the least loved professionals in the world today, which is why I'm very happy to be leaving the banking industry <laughs> to a much younger person who I think would have the strength and the energy to move the group forward. Now, however, the fact is that if Africa is to develop, if integration is to work, we will need to have large institutions able to make a difference. Now, we see two major trends in Africa going forward. One is the trend of integration. Whether we like it or not, Africa will integrate. Africa will integrate because there's a compelling logic to do that. The power of mobile technology is absolutely incredible. You don't see it here in the States. You don't see it here in the developed world. But in Africa, people are so informed these days that it's very difficult to even rig an election. <laughs> it used to be a lot easier. But you know you have the cameras on the phones, and they take those photos, and you send them straight through to the international community. And, and so you know, life is changing. It's changing in very fundamental ways. So technology, modern technology, it's going to be a major driving force in the integration of Africa. The second compelling trend is consolidation. In life, it's always good to be bigger than smaller. In banking, the same thing applies. So we're seeing the trend in Africa where major African champions are emerging. MTN, out of South Africa, built the eighth largest telecoms company in the world. Dangote, out of Nigeria, has built the sixth largest cement company in the world. So we're seeing the emergence of African companies that have a very important and very significant role to play and are playing in the integration and the modernization of Africa. I'd like to end my presentation to you by just dwelling on a couple of things which um, I was asked to talk about. You're all young people and you're all heading out into the world. Some of you have been there and come here for a couple of years and going back. And how do you want to see Africa? We do get a lot of proposals from budding entrepreneurs who want to create the next Facebook, and that's good. But the fact is that successful entrepreneurs are very few and far between. Shouldn't discourage you. But usually it's one in a hundred or thereabouts, that turns out very successful, especially in Africa. And I know because I've spent 32 years working with entrepreneurs in Africa. Some of you may decide you want to come back to Africa, and that's good. But you should know why you're coming back to Africa. Because you're African whether you're in Africa or not. You're an African whether you're in Asia, or you're in Europe, or you're in the States, or you're in Latin America. A third possibility, which I want to share with you, is 
to look at working with multinational companies. Work your way up the system. Become one of the leaders. Because whether you like it or not, major companies deploy more assets than smaller companies. And if you can be one of those people, high up in the system, that can say to your company, Africa is not as risky as it's meant to be. Africa is not as dangerous as it's meant to be. Then you can make far more difference to Africa than heading back to Africa. In EcoBank, we run the biggest bank in Chad. How many companies in the United States will vote to invest $30 million in Chad? That's not that many, I guess. We also run the biggest bank in Central Africa Republic. How many companies would vote to do that? However, if you know Central African Republic well enough, you'll know that the risk is manageable. We run the biggest bank in Liberia. We've done so for a long time. So the perception and the reality of doing business in Africa are two very different things. And the reality is that the risk is not as great. The perception is that the risk is way too high. How many people here have been to Lagos? How many people have not been to Lagos? <laughs> I would dare say that the things you've heard about Lagos without going there would be such that you're highly unlikely to go to Lagos for a vacation, right? <laughs> However, I'll tell you a story. We, we, we have annual meetings, what we call business leaders meeting. And we, we brought in, um, some of our business leaders, about 70 people from about 35 countries into Lagos. And, and, and I think they all sort of like checked to make sure that their life policies were in order. Um, <laughs> Their wills were up to date and all that stuff. And, and came with all this trepidation and we had to have people at the airport to meet them straight up the plane. Every single one of them left and said, Mr. Ekwe, I'm going to be back. Because everything I was told about Lagos turned out not to be true. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Africa. Thank you very much. I think we now have time for a few questions, so if you could just line up and step up, we'll take uh, a couple of questions. Hello. Um, thank you, Mr. Ekpe, for coming. I am a student at the business school, and thank you for providing a stunning example of integration in Africa. My question is, having worked in 32 countries, what is EcoBank's view on political risk? And have you found a way that companies can protect themselves to some extent from political risks in some of the riskier countries in Africa? Um, political risk is, is a reality that we face. We, we, and we, we address that in two ways. Firstly, we, we operate in 32 countries. So we do have a diversified portfolio. So for example, when the, the, the banking industry and they went to crisis in Nigeria, we still made a profit. Um, in Côte d'Ivoire, um, the banking industry was shut for a while. We still continued. The impact on the group was not that significant. So one way to address the political risk is to have a diversified business across Africa. And the other way to do it is, is to take a long-term view and take the view that if you're not going to go into Africa and pull out, in the long term, you do make money. It's very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, the major multinationals in Africa never leave. Unilever, Nestle, they have never left Africa. They've been investing, Guinness, Heineken, they never leave. I think that says something. And in many cases, 
What it's telling you is that it does make sense in spite of the political risk to be in Africa. It is profitable in spite of the risk to be in Africa. The other thing you could do in order to meet your investor requirement is go buy political risk insurance. But to me, that's wasting money. Well, that's... Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Aisata, I'm from Mauritania. Uh, I've noticed that in the last years, there are more, of mo more and more um, international banks in Africa. And I just was wondering what was the strategy of EcoBank and what was your competitive advantage regarding those uh, foreign banks in Africa? Thank you. I, I think you're right in the sense that Africa is becoming more attractive because, um, look, you're not going to go very far if you want to have a growth strategy based on Europe, right? Okay. Um, so where is the growth? Where is the growth? The growth in Asia is tapering off, but the real growth is in Africa. I, I just gave you some numbers. A market that's growing at 15%. We are not worried about competition. We believe that the market is still highly underbanked. Banking penetration is, what, 20% or less. I think what we see is the potential to cooperate with these banks to grow the market and then we can compete as to how we share the market. As far as EcoBank's competitive advantage is concerned, I'll give an example, and I'll use the example of a very successful African businessman. He's supposed to be the richest African businessman. His name is Aliko Dangote. And, and he used to run a bank called UBA um, a long time ago, about 10 years ago. And he was one of our biggest customers. And I went to him when I said, look, tell me, um, what are you doing with our money? And he told me, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing that. And I said, fine. And he said he was building a cement plant. And I said, well, so what? And he said, look, it's $700 million. And I said, see what? I said, well, you can have Lafarge or Cemex, and they can come in, and they can invest more. And he asked me a question, which I'll ask you today. How many boards of directors in the world would vote $700 million for a cement plant in Nigeria? His answer was none, and that was his competitive advantage. That is our competitive advantage. How many boards of directors will go into Chad, approve going into Chad, into Central Africa, acquiring a Shonic Bank in Nigeria? The difference between perception and reality, the fear factor, that can be a major competitive advantage. Mr. Akpe, uh, it's truly a pleasure for you, uh, having you here. Uh, my name is Kofi, and I'm from Togo. And you... <laughs> uh, I know you spent a great deal talking about the bank from the 80 all the way till today. And would you elaborate more on you know, going forward where the bank is going and how does it plan to get there? Five or 10 year strategy plan? Thank you. Well, I, I really do not want to constrain my, my successor, but I can share with you what I think. I think that our competitive advantage is in middle Africa. I think that we know that territory very well. We have been successful, and there's still a lot of room for growth. I think we need international outpost to feed our African network, because whether you like it or not, Africa is a trading continent. Um, I think we need to forge much closer alliance with South Africa, because South Africa is a significant pool of capital and resources. And, and I think that should keep us going for quite a while. I, I don't think we should go off and, and start trying to compete uh, with banks in the more developed countries. I don't think we have the capacity or the ability to do so, and I think that would be a mistake. But I think within Africa, we have significant competitive advantage because we don't have the fear factor. And because we know we have local knowledge, we have no local operations, we are far more tuned to what's going on locally than an international bank would be. 
Hi, my name is Tinyiko from uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. My question is, as a regional bank, um, I, I would presume you have more insights about you know, regional uh, integration in terms of the economies. What are the projects that you are doing in infrastructure, for example, that would help uh, regional integration? Some examples. The answer is that we're not doing enough in, 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 in infrastructure projects and regional integration because really we are banks. We're not um, really promoters. So we work with people who have projects of that nature. And we work with the IFC and with ADB uh, in projects, for example, in transportation, uh, in power, regional power pools. Um, but really, we are more of a catalyst. We are not a leader in those areas. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Kelecho Kerr, and I'm from Nigeria. Um, it seems that in advanced economies, uh, one of the things that one of the elements that keeps them going is that money circulates. Uh, for example, in the U.S., um, when consumers stop buying, you know, bad things start happening. What are some of the things that your bank does, or do you get into influencing policy to sort of set up strategies or uh, ways to keep money circulating? Uh, because I know that you know, in Nigeria, money tends to stay you know, in a few hands. Uh, let's say those that have the money, they sort of keep it, and maybe they do whatever they want with it. They, they put it in a Swiss bank account, and it doesn't circulate. Uh, what are some other things that you're doing, or do you get into influencing po government policy to make sure that money is circulating uh, to, to the hands of you know, everyday lives? We probably don't do it in a, in a political sense in terms of telling the government that you know, the money should circulate more. But I think one of the things, two things we try to do, one is we work very closely with the, the, the bottom of the pyramid to try and get them to, to create wealth, okay? Um, and, and we begin to see some improvement in that because money eventually circulates. It's just the manner in which it circulates. Um, a lot of Africans have money abroad, um, but as Africa stabilizes, that money is coming back in. Uh, there's a lot of growth in Africa, so we're seeing a lot of investments. EcoBank, for example, is one of the largest investors, if not the largest, in the banking sector in Africa. And that money is coming from Africans, and it's coming from other um, 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 non-African investors who see the opportunities in Africa. I think in terms of the political ability to, to get the, the uh, richer people to spend money in Africa, I think as Africa becomes more interesting to them, then they will invest that money in Africa. And I think if you look at companies such as Dangote and various other companies that are making changes in Africa, they're making money because money is circulating in Africa. It's kind of difficult to make money if money doesn't circulate. So our role is really more, again, of, of trying to facilitate that process, but we, we're not sort of advocates um, for significant political change in terms of how money is distributed in a country. Hi. My name is Chijoke from Holt International Business School. Yeah, um, I have a question. Why would Nestle, for example, in Nigeria, want to transfer funds to maybe Nestle in um, Cote d'Ivoire. Why would the funds have to come through the United States, maybe Bank of America, before going back to a bank in Cote d'Ivoire? Is, is, is there a platform or is there uh, a platform, is there, is there a platform in Africa where you can just have um, cross funds transfer? rather than going through intermediary banks outside of Africa? Um, that platform exists. I think, um, as I said, EcoBank does have that platform. We do it for a lot of companies, um, but it just depends on which bank a, a company is using. If, if Nestle is using EcoBank, then we will still route the money within the EcoBank system because we have branches in all those countries. Um, if you're routing it to another bank that potentially has to work through Europe, then obviously the money will come through Europe. But in terms of the infrastructure in Africa, for money transfer, both at the wholesale and the retail level across Africa, that exists as we speak. Um, it's not being utilized as much as it should, but that is growing. Uh, I think the most important thing to bear in mind 
is that things are happening. Okay, a lot of things that didn't happen before are happening now, and I think in 10 years' time, you'll see less and less of monies being routed through Europe. I mean, we, until we had branches across Africa, we, there's a lot of services we couldn't offer. We had to go through other banks, including European banks. But as we have more presence in Africa, we're able to do a lot ourselves on our own. So I, I think that's something you'll see will improve over time. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Hello, Mr. Ekpe. Uh, I'm Gabino Gerangomba from Central African Republic. First and foremost, thank you for putting our country on the map. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question is, um, in, has to do with intellectual property and innovation. Um, does EcoBank has a program uh, to specifically fund entrepreneurs, uh, African diaspora entrepreneurs that have projects, and specifically projects that are tied to intellectual properties? Uh, what we found is that, uh, especially when we, you have a project that I've never done before or that the terms of the uh, current uh, venture capital or angel are not quite adapted to our best interest, uh, we almost have no, no, no place to turn. So uh, what do you have to say about that? Um, yes, we do have some money for venture capital type things, but we do have what we call EcoBank Foundation. Ecobank Foundation is a CSR initiative, and we essentially donate 1%, up to 1% of our profit after tax to the foundation, and that foundation would typically be the ones that would consider initiatives of that nature. Ecobank itself is a bank. We're subject to very strict regulatory uh, guidelines, and we need to separate non-banking, which is essentially what it's from, but from banking activities. So if you're interested in, 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 in a venture that requires some funding, then we would have no problems introducing you to EcoBank Foundation, and they'll look at it on the merits and decide whether or not it's worth supporting. Yeah. So I guess the very last question from the gentleman over there. Thank you for uh, your insightful presentation. I run a uh, financial advisory firm after my own name, and we structure and raise capital for projects uh, throughout Central Africa and Southern Africa. Um, and uh, my question is, you know, as you've been expanding rapidly into some of the more frontier nations throughout your uh, illustrious career, uh, it's a two-part question. One is, uh, you expressed a, a lack of, uh, of fear, uh, which I, I find admirable. Um, and then the sec uh, my, my question is, what kept you up at night? What, what were you scared of as you kind of went into these markets? And the next question is, uh, building the base that you have uh, and the experience, uh, what's next for you personally when you go to the next phase in your career? Okay. Um, the second one is much easier to answer. Um, I, 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 my next, I'm actually um, retiring. I'm not resigning. Um, so, so I'm looking forward to, to doing those things that I couldn't do when I, when I was, was working. Um, we do have a mandatory retirement age of 60, and I'm going to be 59 and a half then, so I think it's time to go. So I'm looking forward to being a grandfather and traveling and doing a few other things that you do at that age. Um, although I've received more um, job proposals in the last two months than I did in the last 10 years. Um, in terms of what, what keeps me awake at night, relating to EcoBank. Um, let me tell you what doesn't worry me. It, it, it doesn't worry me that there's going to be a political blow up in the country. It doesn't worry me that there might be some, some unrest. It, the thing to keep in mind is that Africans are all looking for a better life. Africans right now see what's going on in the rest of the world, and they're saying, we want that to happen in Africa. So they're not going to allow their governments to go back and do what they used to do before. And those governments are under a lot of pressure. So those things don't worry us. Um, what worries us are actually the modern things. For example, we have a huge technology infrastructure, and there's hacking, there's all of that stuff. And we, we're investing serious amounts of money, firewalls. I've learned more about technology in the last two years than I did in the previous 50. <laughs> because, because they tell you, that you have this potential risk and this potential risk and the CIA has been hacked and the French Minister of Finance has been hacked and, and we're transferring money using technology. So that's a problem. 
but I think it's a problem for every bank. Uh, the second challenge for us is capacity. I mean, we're always looking for good people. We're always looking for good people who want to make a difference, who just don't want to earn a salary. Now, the question is, and I want to say this, and this is very important for some of you. If you want to make a difference, you've got to make a sacrifice. You cannot make a difference without making sacrifice. I decided at a certain stage in my life, and I think my wife thought I had a midlife crisis, because typically when you're in your early 40s, you get a new wife or a new car, <laughs> or, or, or both in some cases. Um, I, 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 I stayed with my wife of uh, 27 years or so, um, but then I went, I went, uh, I went to work for EcoBank. Um, and at that point in time, it, as I said, it was in Togo, it didn't make sense. Why would you, as my boss said in Citibank, said, why would you leave Citibank to go and work for a bush bank? And I said, <laughs> and I said well, um, maybe that's what I should be doing. Um, and and so, so we, started, we started on that journey. And, and we built EcoBank to where it is today. And sometimes when I talk to make presentations, I, I sort of give the impression that it was all planned and it all worked according to plan. That's not true. That's not true. OK, we had some scary times. And we had, but I'd like to just say something. Beyond the money, please try and make a difference. I could have been earning several times what I'm earning today if I was working out of London, if I was working out of New York. But I can tell you that as I retire, I feel extremely fulfilled because we've done something interesting. We built the first Pan-African bank. I'm not a successful entrepreneur, but that's not important. I'm not even the most successful corporate executive, but that's not important. But we assembled a team of Africans who believed, who wanted to make a difference. And I like to say to people that EcoBank is not a bank. It's a movement disguised as a bank. It's a bunch of Africans who said, we will do it.